Thank you very much, and uh, I'm very happy to see all the people here, mostly known faces, that have come to, uh, to watch this defense. So the title of the talk contains uh, four of the keywords, actually, of the talk. I will talk a lot about waves, a lot about vibrations, and band gaps and optimal designs. So there's one special word, band gaps, that I think deserves a special attention, uh, mostly because uh, it's, it might be unfamiliar to many of you, and also uh, because it's actually uh, the phenomenon or the keyword that started research. So imagine now wave propagation in a material. So uh, the gray box at the bottom represents the material, and the line represents the wave pulse propagating through this material. Uh, so we all know that if we put an obstacle in front of a wave, something happens. So we will now put an obstacle in front of the wave in the form of an inclusion of a different type of material. So what will happen, of course, is that when this wave meets the, uh, the obstacle, a part of it will be reflected. Some part will be transmitted through the material, hit the other obstacle over here or the other interface, and a part of the, flame, uh, of the wave will actually make it through uh, this obstacle. But what happens now if we slice this uh, obstacle on this inclusion up in parts? So maybe a little surprising, actually, we can see that the wave is actually totally rejected by this inclusion. Uh, so just by slicing up the inclusion in many periodic uh, segments, we actually manage to reflect most of the wave. And this is known as the band gap phenomenon. Uh, so it seems like magic almost, but uh, it is of course not magic. And it was nicely uh, explained in a schematic drawing by uh, Eli Jablonovich, uh, where he showed that it's actually uh, how it's just uh, an effect of reflected waves in phase from each of these inclusions. Uh, so he had already explained that uh, some years earlier. But this phenomenon was actually quite well understood and uh, thoroughly described already in 46 by uh, Boulogne. And also, we can actually date this all the way back to Lord Rayleigh for an explanation of the band gap effect. Uh, so this is actually just, you can say, a toy problem, a uh, very simple toy problem. But we actually see this band gap phenomenon in many different uh, settings for many different types of waves, for acoustic waves, for elastic waves, uh, and optical waves. Uh, so without going into any details at all, let me just briefly show some applications. Uh, we have for, uh, optical applications in photonic crystals, in uh, photonic crystal waveguides. And we actually also see this effect in living creatures. So this is the uh, example of the sea mouse. So the sea mouse has a periodic texture of its spine, and that leads to very colorful reflections. Uh, so here we also see it. Uh, for the acoustic application, there we have uh, seen examples of sound sculptures. You may say this is not an application, but we have similar effects shown in, uh, in sound barriers. And for elastic vibrations, we see uh, application vibration isolators, and also very recently in, uh, for, in phononic resonators. Uh, so this type of effect, the band gap effect, may occur both in uh, 1D, in 2D, and in 3D periodic materials, as shown here. Uh, but I think still uh, the name or the term band gap needs some explanation because many people think, or at least some people think, that it has something to do with the spacing in between uh, the periodic inclusions. And that's not the, the meaning of the word. So the meaning of the word band gap is actually that we have a gap in the frequency spectrum in the band diagram. So what is a band diagram? Well, the x-axis represents the uh, wavelength and the wave direction combined. And the y-axis represents the frequency of the wave. And each of the bands in the band diagram rep represents a propagating mode. <coughs> so it's clear if we have regions where we have no bands, then we have no waves that can propagate with this frequency. And that means that we cannot have any wave propagation uh, through an infinite periodic material. So this concept of an infinite material is, of course, a little bit strange to a mechanical engineer because we always have a finite structure with finite boundaries. So one of the first aims was here to actually uh, analyze how does band gap materials affect vibrations in a finite me mechanical structure. So uh, the first work was actually to understand uh, what happens if we change the number of segments in a structure. So we use this structure as uh, uh, we analyzed this structure using a mass spring model, which is shown here. And we showed how 
important it was, uh, or the importance of the number of cells, or we can call them unit cells, that we place in the structure. So we can actually see here, uh, the vertical lines here represents the predicted band gap for the infinite material. So we can see clearly that there's a footprint of the band gap material within this band gap frequency range. We have a significantly reduced vibration level. Only not if we have like for three times three uh, unit cells, we can actually see that this is too few to actually be able to see the band gap effect in the finite structure. Curiously enough, there's a large vibration level here inside, but this is actually due to waves being able to, tra uh, to uh, travel along the boundaries of the structure. We can also try to manipulate uh, the unit cells so we can move down the uh, frequency range for low vibration levels to a lower frequency range. And this we can do by creating another unit cell where we have a very heavy inclusion in rubber-like spring surroundings. And this actually enables us to put down the frequency range to a low range uh, in the vicinity of the local resonance frequency for the resonator. Uh, another thing that was done in the beginning was to go to the lab because we could predict these things, uh, but could we actually see it in the lab when we went down there? Uh, or would it drown in other effects that we didn't account, account for in the model? So we make a very simple experiment with the segments of, uh, I think it was aluminum and plastic for this particular specimen. And fortunately, we did see a very good agreement between the theory and the experiments. Uh, later, I also had a couple of diploma uh, students doing a project on uh, acoustic band gap structures, also creating a waveguide in the uh, band gap structure here. And they also saw reasonable ex uh, agreement between the theory that was made with ANSYS calculations and the experiments. Um, another thing uh, that we went on to study was this uh, effect of the local resonators because this was really uh, attracting a lot of attention uh, both for uh, mechanical structures where it was known as locally resonant materials and also for actually for electromagnetic materials where you have the same effect and usually uh, denoted the meter materials. So we started this in the context of a 1D mass spring chain where we have attached uh, some oscillators and we decided to both uh, include the effect of uh, nonlinearities, a nonlinear spring here, and the damper, because uh, one could imagine that you would have very large uh, motion of the inclusions. Uh, and if it's embedded in a rubber material, which is often seen, then we could have high dissipation also. And we want to see if we can utilize this to further increase the damping properties of the structure. And we did actually see some effects of. Uh, or some benefits of having a nonlinear springs, so we could increase the frequency range for which we could attenuate the vibrations, or attenuate the waves traveling through the chain. Uh, but the effect was not very clear, uh, actually, and we also saw a lot of noise because uh, we had nonlinear wave wave interactions, so the picture was uh, indeed not very clear here. But we could also see that we could actually improve uh, the performance quite a bit if we made the chain or the distribution of the nonlinear oscillators non-uniform, then we could further increase the frequency range with low uh, amplitude vibrations. Uh, so we have seen that for a periodic structure, we have a very low vibration level, actually, if we're within the band gap. So one of the questions that was natural to put, uh, are these structures then optimal for having low uh, vibration levels? And this was studied uh, in a few papers. Uh, using uh, the design method topology optimization, so we wanted to optimize the material distribution to see if we would indeed get these periodic structures as optimal designs. So I'm not going to go into any details with the optimization method. Uh, I will just try to answer the question, uh, and the answer is yes and no. So we can see the and then sample optimized structure obtained with the uh, design method, so we can actually see that we would get a periodic like structure as the optimal design or the optimized design. Uh, but the unit cells would not be uniform. And this would be, of course, due to the effect of the finite size of the specimen. And we can also see in this case that the inclusions would move to the boundaries of the structure to eliminate wave propagation along the, uh, the boundaries. And if we plot the uh, uh, response for the uh, optimized structure, we would get an improvement compared to the uh, purely periodic structure. Uh, so the way this was formulated in terms of the optimization problem was that we would put on an excitation on the left boundary, minimize the response on the opposite boundary, and repeat this for all four boundaries so that we would get a symmetric structure. 
And as I mentioned, in mo many cases we would get a uh, periodic light structure. But we also found out that if we had the low contrast between the material constituents, so that it wouldn't be aluminum and epoxy, but some other materials, then we would not get this periodic light structure. And this would be due to the fact that you could actually also not get a band gap material with, the, with this contrast. So there was a direct link between these two things. Uh, we later extended uh, the work to include out of plane bending vibrations and found that we could uh, do a similar study and found periodic like structures for distribution of the two materials in the structure to minimize the vibration levels. Uh, we actually later uh, did experiments, so this is in a related paper that's not in the thesis, but we did experiments for band gap structure for outer plane bending vibrations, and we saw good agreements between uh, the experiments and the theory for, for this kind of structure. Uh, so at this point, I would like to point the uh, attention to a specific uh, effect that we found very useful, uh, and that was the role of including artificial damping in the optimization procedure. So. Uh, so, in addition to the physical damping that might be present, uh, we would add strong artificial damping. And let me try to illustrate why. So, if we see the response, the undamped response of a periodic structure, uh, we can see a lot of uh, structural resonances. And this actually causes the optimization problem to have many local minima. So, we create a multitude of local minima. Uh, so, we can see what happens with the structure if we add damping, if we have moderate damping, strong damping, then we actually eliminate the local structural resonances and thereby remove these uh, unwanted local minima. But we still get the same uh, behavior in the band gap frequency range. So this was very useful for creating uh, optimized designs. So let me just go on to some uh, more results that we obtained uh, using this formulation. So we did structures for eliminating wave propagation. And if we had a long design domain, we would get band gap structures or very periodic like structures. If we would move down so we would have that the structural dimensions were the order of magnitude as the wavelength, then we could no longer create the uh, periodic structures, but we would get uh, more intricate structures. So this is for compression waves, shear waves, and a combination of the two. And it was also extended to include multi-frequency optimization so that we would uh, actually optimize the performance for a range of frequencies and not only a single frequency. Uh, we also uh, tried to modify the optimization problem a little bit because you might not be interested only in, in reflecting waves. Instead, you might want to optimize or to dissipate waves. So we wanted to study how do we distribute the absorption, uh, the distribution of absorbers, and maybe also some stiff scatterers in the optimization or in the design domain in order to uh, maximize the dissipation. So we could see here, so this actually works in a little bit interesting way. So the uh, we want to allow the waves to uh, pass the first boundary here. We want the waves to be reflected uh, at, the at the rear boundary here. And we want a distribution of absorbers in order to dissipate the waves. Uh, so this is the meaning of this arrangement of, of the absorbers. <coughs> it's actually possible to improve the performance a little bit if we included both absorbing materials and stiff scattering materials in the design domain. So as the last example here, uh, I will show some work on acoustic design. So here we wanted to uh, optimize sound barriers so that we would minimize the pressure sound behind the sound barrier. And as a result, we obtained some. So here is the design domain. And we obtained different designs for different frequency ranges. Uh, and we actually recently uh, reinvestigated this problem uh, by treating not the sound pressure itself as the objective function, but rather the conception of loudness, which increase, uh, leads to a different uh, objective function. So these are quite new results for this problem. Uh, so uh, another way to look at the optimization problem would be to look at the eigenfrequencies of the structure. So if you have a, large, a band gap with a low frequency response, or a low amplitude response here, you can actually see that there's a large gap between the two eigenfrequencies on each side here. So we could also create the structures by maximizing this gap uh, and thereby creating optimized structures. So this was done for a 1D structure here and where we maximize the difference between the second and third, third and fourth and so forth uh, frequencies in the structure. And then we're actually we could see a one-to-one -one relation between the number of frequencies that we separated and the number of periodic segments in the optimized structure. 
And it was shown that there was actually an asymptotic, asymptotic limit to how much you can actually separate uh, higher order uh, modes with a given contrast between the materials. So now we uh, actually changed the setting a little bit because we had uh, we talked with people from the photonics department here at DTU, and uh, uh, we got into trying to use this optimization technique to design <coughs> photonic crystal waveguides. So what are the problems with the photonic crystal waveguides? Well, as you see, we have nice propagation through uh, the the waveguide in this bandgap material, but the problem is if you want to have bends in the structure. So you can see here uh, at the bends we have large def uh, reflections due to uh, well the difficulties for the wave to move around the bend. So we wanted to try to optimize this in order to get a better performance. So this, this actually also changed a little bit the usual practice of how it was normally done because uh, there had been some optimization studies done with the genetic algorithms where they modified the parameters of a few holes in the vicinity of the bend. Uh, but most normally people have been tired of uh, squeaking the structure a little bit by modifying holes or moving the holes a little bit or actually just removing holes uh, from the bends, mostly by trial and error procedures. Um, so the first structure that was studied was the 90 degree bend. So this is a structure that consists of glass rods in air, a periodic distribution, and we have the 90 degree bend here. So we actually just wanted to modify the corner region here uh, because we didn't want to, there's no need to modify the actual uh, photonic uh, crystal itself. Uh, so the structures that were out there were was what I call the generic structure, and there are also a couple of other suggestions that have been uh, made in literature of how you could improve the performance of this uh, this event. Uh, some of them have low loss for specific frequencies, but all of them display large loss if you look at it look at it over a broader frequency range. So by starting from the uh, generic design in the optimization, after about a thousand iterations, we arrived at this uh, optimized design, which is, is quite different from what had been seen before. And it had a low loss in the entire frequency range of interest. And you can see here uh, the nice wave propagation for shorter wave and a longer wave uh, through this optimized structure. So after talking a little bit more to the photonics people of what they really were interested in, we came up with another device, uh, which we call the C-band here. So this actually uh, is a consecutive, uh, two consecutive 120 degree bends. And you can see here in the animation how the, uh, so the design region is just in the corners here. So you can see actually uh, the redistribution of the material of the glass and the air in the corner regions. And you can see the resulting uh, wave propagation through the optimized design, where we have a nice flow of the, uh, of the optical uh, signal here. And it was actually fabricated and showed very nice uh, performance. Uh, so we did another couple of different components, such as the splitter and the 60 degree bend. Uh, and actually, with this idea, moved closer to the idea of making circuits with these uh, kinds of devices, low loss circuits, optical circuits. We also considered both uh, advanced uh, structures, so this is a wavelength splitter. So you have a signal composed of both short and longer wavelengths, and you will have, you want the shorter or the longer to move one way, and the, the other part to move the other way. So this leads to this very intricate uh, optimal, uh, optimized design. And we also had collaboration with the research Japanese group, who used our optimization code to make uh, different kinds of devices, such as this uh, waveguide cross here. That was optimized. So this leads me to another one of the uh, more uh, detailed points that was seemed to be very useful for creating these optimized designs, and that was uh, the idea of using damping to obtain a so-called black-white design. So you might see here that uh, we have some gray uh, elements here, and there's actually nothing in the optimization procedure that prevents the elements to be gray or from being gray, and this means that we cannot interpret the material as either black or white or glass or, or air. So we needed to do something about it. And the idea was to add damping that was only active in the gray material. 
So this means that uh, if we want to maximize the power flow through the component, it would be uneconomical to have the gray material, and it would be removed if we, if we cranked up this epsilon parameter here in front of the, uh, the extra term. So we would be able, in this way, to create nice, crisp, black-white designs in this way. And it actually acted a little bit more smoothly than uh, if you use explicit uh, penalization by normal techniques. So uh, there are other types of waveguides than uh, photonic crystal waveguides. So we also studied what happens if you optimize uh, simple, what we call rich or strict waveguides. So here you actually just rely on the high index contrast between two materials, glass and air in the surrounding to guide the waves. And here the problems uh, when we have bends also exist and they're maybe a actually a little bit more severe because you do not have the photonic crystal around to confine the light to the guide. Uh, so the problem of a wave splitter was considered, so we want to have 50% going up, 50% going down, and find the optimized distribution of material here, so this is accomplished. And uh, these are the results, so there are two different designs. So this looks maybe a little bit strange, but since light can propagate through air with no problems, there is no uh, problem in this design. So if we actually increase the damping a little bit to make it a little bit more expensive to have air, then we'd, we'd get the other design here, which is uh, otherwise a little bit, performs a little bit worse. So we could get smaller losses if we increase the design domain, either by extending in this direction or in the other direction. Okay, so uh, all the work on photonic and for, for nonic crystals uh, that actually led to a, new, a few new, you can call it optimization procedures that we pursued further. So one of the problems that we encountered uh, during the process is that if you want to do optimization of frequency ranges, then you have to evaluate the response at many single frequencies, and this is very expensive. <coughs> so I've shown here the response for, for a harmonic, harmonically forced uh, uh, solid here. But here we could use, found out that we could use the Padet approximate very accurately to approximate the, uh, the response in a quite large frequency range efficiently. So we see how it works. You choose an expansion frequency, and you choose a number of expansion terms in the Padet approximant. So for two, three, four, or five terms only, you get a very nice agreement in a large frequency range. So by this technique, we could efficiently uh, treat uh, frequency range optimization problems. Uh, so this has been shown, or uh, I've shown here on a sample problem. So we want to minimize the response of the structure in a frequency range from 0 to 0 0.038 here that actually encompasses the first natural frequency of the initial structure. So the optimized structure looked like this and uh, you can see the effect that it has moved up the first resonance frequency to above uh, the frequency range of interest. <coughs> and here's the associated uh, mode shape at the first natural frequency. So in this case the optimized structure is actually quite uh, similar to what you would get if you just optimize the structure for static compliance, getting no stiff structure with 50% of material. But if we increase the frequency range a little bit, uh, then we would get a qualitatively different design uh, shown here. Uh, and it is, this has been accomplished by uh, moving together the first resonance frequency and the first anti-resonance frequency close together, and thereby minimizing uh, the frequency response in this frequency range. And I've here animated the first resonance frequency and the first anti-resonance frequency uh, also. Yes. So uh, when we did the work on the local resonators, it was clear that we could actually uh, improve the performance if we didn't have a uniform distribution of these attached nonlinear oscillators. So we tried to put this into an optimization framework. Uh, so studying the same kind of system, a mass spring, 1D mass spring chain with attached uh, oscillators here. And we uh, did full uh, numerical, uh, full transient simulations of the system. So we have here included uh, the cubic nonlinearities from the attached uh, nonlinear oscillators. Uh, we could use the same kind of optimization procedure uh, now based on transient formulation, but this was not, uh, turned out not to be a real problem, also not with the nonlinearities included. And we would get, uh, we could manage to, we could manage to get uh, some designs for different types of waves propagating through the chain. So to the left here, 
I have shown the uh, a wave pulse propagating through a chain. So I should say that the pins here represent uh, the attached oscillators and this box here represents the waveguide. So you can see here how the attached oscillators are set, set in motion as the wave passes through the waveguide. And by, optim um, by the optimized distribution of parameters, parameters for these uh, oscillators, we could actually reduce the wave propagation uh, for, the, uh, for the wave pulse. And here the same was done for a time harmonic wave. So you can actually see here the strong uh, attenuation of the wave. Uh, and also the strong nonlinear response due to the presence of the nonlinear oscillators here. And so the last example, uh, or the last case that we studied, was to uh, try to sort of extend uh, the topology optimization technique to include uh, dynamic structures. So what do I mean by that? Well, in the normal setting, you would uh, optimize the structure for its static properties. So you find a material distribution that would uh, optimize the structure, also for a dynamic load. But the idea was to see what can we actually obtain if we also allow the structure to be dynamic. That is, that it can change its material properties in time. So uh, something like this. So we could imagine that in time had material properties that could vary, uh, so it could, could move around. So of course, this is a little bit hard to imagine how you could have material properties that vary in time. But there are, there are actually ways from which you can, by external excitation, you can switch parameters, structural parameters, such as the, uh, uh, the angles of uh, laminates uh, or other kinds of uh, external ac activation or control of the physical parameters of the structure. So this could be possible. Or we could have uh, materials such as electromagnetic or electro-rheological materials that change their properties when you put on an electric or a magnetic field. So this was tried on, uh, on a simple 1D case where we tried to find what is, the max what, uh, what is the optimal distribution in time and space of the material in the design domain such that we, min we minimize the propagation or minimize the transmission of a wave pulse. So for the static case, we actually know the answer, of course, but because we have already seen that this is a band gap type structure. For the static case, we, this will reduce the, amp uh, the transmission the most. But for uh, the dynamic case, we actually get an uh, interesting structure like this. So how should that be interpreted? Well, this is shown in an XT plot. And it's maybe more uh, easily visualized if we do an animation of both the structure and the wave. So the optimized structure here is actually a band gap structure that moves along with the wave. So in this way, uh, the transmission is actually reduced by a factor two compared to the static band gap case. So this actually uh, sort of brings me back to where I started by showing some uh, simulations of waves in uh, materials. And uh, this was the last example. So I would just like to now uh, thank all the uh, collaborators of the different papers. So I listed all the co-authors here. Hope I haven't missed anybody, especially nobody who's present. So uh, <laughs> and I would just like to thank uh, also uh, Peter Boral, who made this very nice animation that takes us uh, flying through an optimized waveguide structure. So uh, this ends my, ends my talk. So uh, thank you for your attention.